Hi, my name is Dave. Today I'm going to show you a conglomeration of confusing catadioptric Cassegrain telescopes. Try and say that once. It's a very strange circumstance here that all four of these telescopes are actually Cassegrain telescopes and they're actually catadioptric Cassegrain telescopes. So they have a configuration of a classical telescope, but they've also got lenses involved someplace, one way or the other. I have individual videos about each of these scopes. Please see the discussion for links to those videos. This is the telescope that inspired me to make this video. This is the Vixen VMC 95. Um, now Vixen makes several versions of this, 95, uh, 110, uh, 200 and something, and I think they even make a 260 or something of the same kind of telescope. Now they're calling this a Maksutov. I know what a Maksutov is. You know what a Maksutov is. A Maksutov is a telescope with a meniscus lens like this. It's got a nice deep curvature to it. They're excellent telescopes. Look at this one. Uh-oh, they forgot to put the meniscus in. Uh, this is a different ball game. Something fishy going on here. Technically, this is called a Maksutov telescope. It's a very strange kind of a Maksutov. Well, the whole thing got me so kind of irritated, so I had to investigate the whole thing, find out what the heck was going on. Now, suppose I've got two telescope mirrors here, and I tell you that one of them is parabolic and one of them is spherical. Can you tell the difference just by looking at them? Go ahead, take a good close look. Of course, you can't tell the difference just from looking at them. The only way you can tell the difference between a parabolic and a spherical surface on a mirror is by very, very careful testing. The cost to manufacture of the parabolic mirror would be considerably higher. It's approximately twice. All right, in the case of a Cassegrain telescope, you have uh, two elements, uh, two mirrors, this is the secondary mirror, that's the primary. In the case of a classical Cassegrain, this is parabolic and that's elliptical. And a Ritchie Creechin, this is hyperbolic here and this is hyperbolic there. In the case of a Dahl Kirkham, this is elliptical and that is spherical. In no cases are both of these spherical mirrors. So that's a difficulty with a classical Cassegrain, it means that things are harder to figure. If you made these with both spherical mirrors, the telescope wouldn't be any good. The optics would be terrible. So the manufacturers, in their infinite wisdom, have decided to try and make both of these spherical, inexpensive, cheap to manufacture, and uh, do some modifications one way or the other to try and make it into a decent telescope. This is where the light goes in a Schmidt cast screen, like a little mead. Comes in through here, bounces off. The main thing is it goes through this thing here. That's the corrector plate. That's a refractive kind of a, an element. It's not a pure Cassegrain. In the case of a Maksutov, you've got a corrector plate here right in the front. Very thick corrector plate. Light comes through that corrector plate, bounces off a couple of mirrors. Well, this is actually a reflected part, a reflective part of the um, corrector plate here. So. That's what's going on in the Maksutov Cassegrain. In the case of a Vixen VMC, the light comes in from over here, strikes the spherical mirror, goes through a spherical corrector kind of a device here. This is a uh, very much like a Maksutov corrector, only on a much smaller scale. Hits the mirror, comes back straight through here and back to the eyepiece. In the case of the Kinko Spacia, the light comes in over here strikes a spherical mirror here, another spherical mirror there. Now that comes into the, this is just a baffle tube and there are a couple of lens elements in here, spherical lens elements, comes out to the tailpiece. So again, it's an all spherical telescope. Uh, the correction is done by these two guys down here. This is a fine book on uh, telescope optics. Um, and if you open this book to page 297, you get a series of diagrams. All of these are catadioptric cassegrains, and they all have correctors built in right behind the secondary 
So, uh, and there's a couple of mangans and a couple of other interesting things, uh, including uh, Klevsov and Arganov and all sorts of other things. And there are a whole different variety of other kinds with the corrector back here. So you have the corrected doll Kirkham kind of a layout. Uh, very interesting, very complicated too, because there are a thousand different varieties. Get the opticians to go in and they can make all sorts of things. So there are a lot of different varieties of these kinds of scopes. Some of them have the optical components built into a small piece of glass or two or three pieces of glass inside the focus or inside the baffle tube in the case of these Cassegrains. Check this one out. This is the Vixen VMC260L. Look at all the optics in this thing. Um, it's got a clear front aperture. Of course, it's got veins on it. There's the primary mirror. And here are three of them, count them, three of them stacked up here, three lenses here, all spherical, I'm sure. And here's a couple more back here for good measure. Almost no refractors have five lens elements in them. All of these telescopes are aimed at a very modest market. They're not designed to be real high-end, very expensive telescopes. There are extremely sophisticated, very fancy telescopes with lots of the super high-quality optics with the uh, built-in correctors in them. For example, the Celestron Edge has uh, correctors inside the tube to help perfect the optics. All this discussion of optics is very interesting, but what really counts is how do the telescopes perform? And I want to tell you, I was a little bit surprised by this. It's not what I would have predicted. Um, both of these scopes uh, perform quite well. This, this one, despite that huge secondary obstruction, I mean, it loses contrast. It's not a great telescope. It's got the corrector down in the baffle and stuff. I expected this to be a Jonesburg kind of a telescope. Really pretty, not great. Uh, but it performs pretty well. Uh, this one performs okay. I would not say perfectly, though. It's not bad. It's just not bad. But not a beautiful telescope. Um, just okay. This one... <laughs> Not great. <laughs> now this is a Max Sutov, a traditional Max Sutov. I'm very familiar with these. And uh, I even double checked myself. I did a sanity check to make sure I was correct. Uh, I compared this with my uh, Questar. And when I compared it with the Questar, this thing just didn't quite stand up to it. It did have a lot of spherical. It's not horrible, but just not great. Nothing like you would expect from a typical good quality Maxutov. The little mead here performed just fine. It was a nice little scope. Nifty little scope comparable to a, a very similar to any other Schmidt Gasserin you've ever seen. Just kind of real good, does the job, uh, doesn't do anything, doesn't blow you away, just does a pretty nice job. So I would say these two were just about equal. This one was uh, not quite up to these the performance. And this one was the lowest quality one of all of them. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this conglomeration of confusing catadioptric <laughs> I, hope... <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this conglomeration of confusing uh jeez. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at this conglomeration of confusing catadioptric Cassegrain telescopes. Thank you for watching.